Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Chris Weston speaking here, Head of Research here at Pepperstone. Uh, I'm in the process of, of putting out a number of webinars together. Um, I started one last month really looking at um, getting an edge in trading. So how I go about my daily process, and we're trying to create a process rather than look at one individual trade and obviously pat yourself on the back if you get a successful trade. We want to have a look at the, the total process, a more holistic process for trading and, and effectively getting an edge in financial markets. And one of the core um, understandings that I use, not just in, in discretionary uh, trading, where I, I use a combination of fundamentals and, and also a technical overlay, um, but I'm tactical in, in, in how I go about approaching markets and, and what markets I want to try and use to take advantage of a theme. And, and, and for that, one of the, the central focuses is, is volatility, be it historic volatility or, in, or the level of implied volatility in financial markets. But at the backbone of that is, is volatility, be it you know, statistical volatility, um, or you can see that in the absolute range or the average range that you see on, on a specific period. Um, volatility gives me uh, the assets and the markets that I, I want to trade. Um, but it also gives me a firm understanding about how much risk I want to take on in the position um, and therefore my position sizing accordingly. So volatility should be, and I'm going to argue why volatility should be a core consideration for your trading. So how does it fit into my process? I think for people who saw my last webinar uh, would have understood that, I, that I, there is a process that I have uh, when I'm identifying a, a trade and how I manage that trade and exposures that I have. Uh, and effectively, that for me is, is the essence of trading it is it's managing exposures and managing risk um, and you know, making sure that you, you, you manage that, that, that correctly at any given time. So my process that, you, that I went over in the last webinar um, you know, it's one that I will or go through for its entirety. And at the end of it, I will look to uh, adjudicate and, and assess how I've gone within that process. And, you know, a successful trade is fantastic. But if you if, if you've made a successful trade and, and but you've stuck to the process that you that you've created, then that's even even better. That's where you can feel re real achievement. And that's where professional traders will come into their own. Um, but specifically, how does volatility fit into my process? Well, you know, I'm looking at charts. Yeah, you know, you can have a look at the, the range expansion that coming through. But I want to make, specifically in this webinar, I want to have an assessment and, and and using volatility to assess the feel, uh, you know, the the, the, you know, the general feel of the market. What is the sentiment? What is the appetite or the lack of appetite to take on risk? Uh, and what market should be working in a period of higher volatility? And when I say volatility, I'm using the word vol. Um, I'm a simple person. I just want to use a, you know, a simple term. And, the, you know, so we're not talking about volume. We're talking about vol. Um, and that's volatility. So we want to assess vol and, and, and market positioning, be it through options and also through futures positioning. Most people out there will be very affay with uh, the CFTC weekly report that looks at um, FX and, and commodity futures and index futures. Um, but we can also look at things called risk reversals, which give us the skew of um, put and call volatility. Uh, and that's for me is, is a much more fluid, a much more liquid market of understanding um, positioning, especially in the effects market. You know, that's what we look at very closely. But a lot of retail traders don't even know it exists and they find it very difficult to get that hold of that information. But a lot of institutional FX traders, specifically on the speculative side, the guys who are the leverage funds who will speculate about price moves, they're not actually hedging exposures. They will look at things called risk reversals quite closely just to get an understanding of much more liquid positioning and sentiment. And that's one something I'm going to explain to you as well. Um, I'm going to look at the understanding how I can use volatility to understand my risk and potential reward, which is kind of uh, really obviously an important part of trading, and then how I can use that then to fine tune my position sizing. So that's the part of the process that I want to show you today and how I uh, fit that in. And I think that's really important for me. So how does um, volatility influence my strategy? So that's what we're going to break it up into three sections. The first point is, is how we can use volatility to define the strategy and the, the markets which are going to work in high and low volatility periods. And then I think, well, you know, what is realized volatility and then is what is implied volatility? And for me, you know, most people will, will be very keen to understand realized volatility or they'll have a strong understanding about the technical indicators you can do to understand uh, realized or historic volatility. But most people won't, uh, unless you're options traders, have a firm idea about what's happening with implied volatility. But before we go on, I think, you know, let's, let's take a step back. You know, what, what, what the hell is volatility? Um, and most people will see volatility uh, from you know, watching various media outlets talking about the, you know, the, the world in crisis and, um, you know, the, the market's getting absolutely smacked around. And, and that's generally when you see markets falling out of bed. 
Um, but volatility is is positional or sorry directional agnostic. Volatility can happen in either direction. It can be up and down. Uh, it is a measure of risk, and that volatility can be backwards looking, which, as I say, is, is, is statistics and, and positioning and, and data points and dispersions that have taken place on a realized or historic basis. Um, or it can be more forward looking. Uh, and, and it's what is the market implying where employ, in, 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 where is market implying volatility is going to be over a specific period from that mean. So it uses the dispersions of returns, market returns from the mean over a specific period it is the volatility of market returns. So there we go. We look at the, the fact that, uh, that, that um, volatility is directionally agnostic. When you've got a, a, a mean of a market, um, whatever that mean you choose to use, um, most people use a 20 day, for example, if you're using a Bollinger Band. I think most people are, are fairly au okay with that situation. But if you look at the dispersion of returns relative to that mean, the wider those dispersions are, the further away the volatility is going to be. And we measure that volatility in standard deviations, which effectively is the square root of variance. And variability is something that, that most fund managers will look at very, very closely because your job is to reduce variability in your portfolio through diversification. Uh, and effectively, variability um, leads us to understand what a standard deviation move is. And that's measured on an annualized basis. So effectively, when you get a data point, the further that data point is from a mean, the greater the volatility. The, the narrower that, that, that data point is to a specific mirror over a, t a period of time, the less volatility we are. So you can have big volatility moves. The S&P could be going up and up and up, and it could be trending higher. But if those, those, those returns that we're seeing um, are getting wider relative to the average, you know, we're saying volatility can creep up. It doesn't necessarily have to be down, although most of the time you will see volatility moves to the downside. This old, this old chestnut that, that markets go up the stairs and down the elevator you know, leads us to understand that most of the time you will see volatility pick up when markets are going down, just with the nature that we tend to see sell-offs much more aggressively on the downside than we do on the upside. But volatility is a measure of risk. It is the dispersion of returns from a mean over an average. So that's really what we're looking at. OK, so let's look at strategy. I think this is really important for me because when I'm looking at, uh, at the volatility in the markets, I'm trying to understand what, what is it going to be? What which markets do I just don't want to be in? What do I want to be involved with? How tactically can I take advantage of high volatility in the market? And, and what is the thematic that's driving that volatility, which, of course, is is so key at the moment? Now, if we have a look at the, the VIX, which is the, the volatility index or the, the implied volatility in the S&P over the coming 30 days, um, this is forward looking. This is this is the implied move that we can get out of this implied volatility. And what we can see here is the, the white line is the VIX index or the, what we call the volatility index. Some people call it the fear gauge. Uh, I don't necessarily like to call it that situation, but let's call it the VIX just to keep things simple. And we can see here that the VIX has gone up from what about 12 percent here uh, up to uh, close to 26 percent in this time through October. Uh, and what we can see here is we can look at the Japanese yen. The Japanese yen on a trade weighted base. I've used the trade weighted Japanese yen rather than just one currency pair. But I'll show you the, the, how this works in a more sort of holistic view in a moment. Um, but you can see the trade weighted Japanese yen has a very strong correlation with implied volatility in the equity market. Generally, that's down to the, to, to the reduction in carry, uh, which, again, I'll talk about in a second. But you can see here, if, if you're seeing the volatility index pick up in, in all asset classes, te we tend to sort of go to the safe haven of the yen. Now, the, the rationale behind that is that the yen is still the mac daddy of currency, um, of, of, of safe haven currencies. They run a fairly punchy current account surplus. And, and it's, yeah, current account surplus is a great place to be um, in times of, of, of for my, uh, you know, financial stress and, and, and the tightening of financial conditions. But it's what, what that current account, what has driven that current account surplus. And in the case of Japan, they've got a big, um, you know, they've lent a lot of investment capital abroad. And the idea here as speculators is we're trying to run front run the idea that money could be coming back to the domestic markets. You know, the Japanese um, uh, regulator, the, the Japanese pension funds and the GPIF um, have been big buyers of stocks over periods of time. And they've been big buyers of U.S. Treasuries over periods of time as well. And um, as a result of what happens then, if we do see a drawdown in markets and, and, and risk aversion, the idea is that, that, that we believe that the perception is that Japanese funds may look to repatriate some of that capital uh, back into the Japanese market. So we can see categorically here um, that the Japanese yen is the place to go should we see uh, the VIX play down. 
We can also see here um, the VIX. I've actually inverted this to, to show the correlation here between um, how the VIX goes up. And if you actually look at the various factors um, and, and how people trade this uh, at more a sort of institutional level, but easily can be done through ETFs, that you'll see a situation where I've got the um, the growth value ratio worked out. So you can see here that um, the growth stocks, when, when the VIX is actually going up, which is what we've got here, um, I've actually inverted it, as I say, so that it's a mirror image of the top pane. So the VIX is actually going up, and we can actually see um, that value is starting to outperform growth stocks. And the opposite is true. So when the VIX is pulling back and we're seeing lower implied volatility in the S&P, you will tend to see growth stocks like tech um, and doing much better than, than value stocks. But you can see, again, the correlation is there for, for you to see. When you see a high volatility index, it's not just the S&P that's going down. It's actually there's a, uh, there's a correlation between what, what sectors you want to be in. You'll tend to be in high, high dividend paying stocks. You're trying to be, you know, looking at being in value names rather than growth. And of course, when volatility is very low, you look to be in, in those really high PE, high cash flow names that you've been seeing. If you have a look at the carry trade index, now this is a measure of um, the, the, the highest carry performing currencies. Uh, we look at things like the Australian dollar, the Kiwi dollar, and also, of course, the US, the US dollar there, which is the highest carry market. Um, and we actually fund that using the three lowest or the lowest funding currencies there. And, and if you look at that, how that works, and what we've got here is the VIX, which is, again, the, the, the S&P volatility over the coming 30 days in the orange line. And we've actually inverted this to show the impact of or the reduction in carry. And now, a lot of hedge funds, macro hedge funds, will, will apply the carry trade in times of low volatility, positively trending equity markets, credit spreads tight relative to U.S. treasuries or uh, investment grade tra um, uh, credit as well. Um, but what we can see here is the inverse effect. So when the VIX is going up, implied volatility is spiking up, markets are having a bit of a tiz, you'll see the carry trade being unwound pretty quickly. So you, you're looking at buying the yen, you're looking at buying the Swiss franc to an extent, you're looking at buying um, you know, some of the more safe haven currencies, um, and you're looking to, to, to sell out of the higher beta names, such as the Australian dollar, such as the Kiwi dollar, such as the Canadian dollar. Uh, and reducing that carry trade. So, of course, the carry trade being you're looking to buy the high yielding assets, you're looking to fund that with, with, with lower yielding assets um, or currencies and, and looking to net off the differential between the two. And you're getting paid income to be in a current current to be in a to be in a currency effectively. It's the same as um, being in high dividend stocks or in the options market. If you're doing covered calls, you're looking to be paid to be in a position. So again, yeah, hedge funds will look at this very closely. You can see carry trades working very, very well. Those high yielding currencies doing very, very well in times of low uh, implied volatility. So again, how does this affect my strategy? Well, you know, if you look at what happened during S uh, the, the September, uh, the, the October drawdown in the in the S and P, we saw it drop 11% high to low. As you can see here from the middle pane, we can see that the S and P volatility, the VIX, going up to 26%. What actually worked in that time? Well, we talked about the trade weighted yen doing quite well. Let's break this down into individual currencies. So we had the dollar here as our base currency. And in that same period that this market drew down, the yen was up 1.1%. So the yen was the starting light. If you had actually bought the yen in that period of, of higher volatility, we would have done very nicely. But what was the thematic? The thematic that caused this was a number of factors. But part of it was down to the fact that we've seen oil prices coming in lower. So we wanted to sell those higher beta currencies. You can see that the Nokia, the CAD, the, the Australian dollar got hit pretty badly because of emerging market concerns during that time. And that is a proxy of emerging markets. But what we can see is a situation where um, the yen was the best performer. Everything else was down except, uh, except the yen, and the U.S. dollar was did very nicely. The British pound had its issues with, with Brexit. And, um, but generally, what we saw is, is the yen working very nicely, those higher beta currencies coming under pressure. And I expect that to continue going forward. Um, if we do see the volatility um, decline, then, yeah, you're probably expecting those currencies that did very poorly to actually start picking up again and, and outperforming them. OK, let's have a look at, um, at what realized volatility is and how we can use that in our trading. So we've looked at how various currencies and various markets will perform uh, when implied equity market volatility is high. And, and, and we've, we've gone through that very categorically. We love the yen. Um, we like shorting the Australian dollar. Um, but again, it really depends on what, what is the, the backbone of what caused that move. In terms of realized volatility, um, the average true range is something that you know that we can use at any one stage. I mean, really, what is the average true range? Now, it is 
a good gauge of market volatility over a specific period of time. And we can use that from 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 actually understanding the, the range expansion or the range contraction. And we can use that very nicely within our risk management. So it is the current high to low. We choose one of the variables here. It's either the, the, the current high to low, um, if the, the moves on a closing basis are confined within um, within that, that, that candle, uh, or in the case of that we see the markets gap higher, it is the, the value of the prior close up to the current high. It encapsulates the true range over a specific period. In the case that we do see a market gapping lower uh, and trading lower from, from that, that, that previous close, uh, we'll take the previous close down to the low on that, that period. So we're tracking the, the absolute or the true range over that specific period. We can use the ATR to understand the appetite and the enthusiasm behind the break. Now, if we see the Aussie dollar breaking out of a specific range, and you know, we want to we say to ourselves, well, what's that actually mean? You know, in stock lands, we're in stock in stock world, we'd say, well, if we actually break through a specific level and we see the volume ramp up, well, that's a quality move. That is a, that is a move of high quality. In the FX market, in the index market, what we'd actually see where we, where we find it very difficult to get that volume is we'd actually look at the ATR, for example, and say, well, if the, ex the ATR, the range is ex expanding, um, then that actually shows that there's real appetite to push that through there as well. So it's not just about using it in a risk sense and understanding you know, how far away we need to put our stop loss, which I'll get into in a second. But we can actually use the ATR to understand the quality of a trend break or quality of a move from A to B. And, you know, if that range picks up, then we can actually see, um, you know, that, that people are giving that real genuine clout uh, in that situation. What is the correct number of days to apply for an ATR as well? I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a question we feel quite a lot from clients. Um, the, the, the more days that you use in that average range, the, 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 the smoother it will be out, the more variables, the more numbers that we'll have to use, then the N word comes out there. The number, um, you know, how many, how many numbers do we have? So the more numbers you have, the smoother that will be out to average that out. Um, but of course, you know, that, that really depends on your strategy and how you're using it. If I go into, if I go into my MT4 charts um, and have a look at where we are, I've got a five-day um, average true range here. I've got stochastic here. I mean, it just obviously it tells where the price is in, in, in the relation to the to the previous range. And I've got a Bollinger Band there as well. I mean, I can use the momentum indicators and other factors as well. But I, I really just, you know, in terms of actual volatility, I tend to use just the ATR uh, and, the, and the Bollinger Bands as well. And this is historic data. This is historic volatility. These are price moves that have happened. This is in the rear view mirror, but they're still useful. They're very useful, in fact. So we're looking at the, the five-day average true range, and we can see that that currently stands around 68 points at the moment. So the, 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 the nature of what we're trying to do here is that we say to ourselves, well, if the average true range over the last five days is 68 points, and I'm coming out uh, and I'm looking at the sort of noticeable low here, which is this, um, this uh, the swing that we saw back on the 13th of November, and the low being... Uh, 71.64. So if I'm going to put a stop loss, say, at 71.60, and current spot prices are 72.31, well, what am I taking? I'm taking 70 points worth of risk. Um, you know, is that outside of the average true range? Well, it is just. I mean, the average true range is 68 points. Now you can see it just ticked a little bit higher. So I'm putting my stop loss 70 points away, and my average range on any one given day is 68 points. Well, I've given myself sufficient enough breathing room. If I'm going to put my stop loss 15 points away, when uh, the average true range is 68 points, well, there's a pretty good chance if I'm thinking about trading this over a specific period that I'm going to get stopped out fairly quickly. Um, so I will tend to use, uh, I will use that, that, that average true range as a guide to give myself enough breathing room. Now, the obvious place on this chart is to put a stop loss below this low, but I might give myself a little bit more breathing room. So we're taught to use two times ATR, perhaps one and a half times ATR. And, and effectively, the higher that that average true range is going up, it's telling you that the further away that you probably need to put your stop loss. And if you're putting your stop loss further away, you're taking more risk. If you're taking more risk, you need to compensate by taking your position size down. But the natural point on this chart that we're going to put a stop loss is, is, is 70 points below this significant low, this swing low that we saw here. And obviously, if we do get a close below that level there, then the, the chances are that we, we come back to test this sort of lows and again increases. So we're going to get out. But we've given ourselves enough room in that situation. If this price here, if this low here was about 15 points away, well, we've got a very low uh, risk entry, but the chances of getting stopped out are very, very high in that situation. So the average true range gives us a sense about the average move that we've been seeing over line over the over that that period we can also take it into 20 days some people will use the 20-day atr as short-term trader i tend to use a five-day 
Um, but what we're using that is to get a sense of the range um, and, and the potential move and how far away we need to put our stop loss um, and to give it sufficient enough breathing room that we're not going to get stopped out straight away. And of course, the, the higher that ATR is, um, the lower we need to make our position size because there is leverage in the market as well. Now, Bollinger Bands, you know, they, they, they show volatility in its purest. Um, you know, you've got your mean. We talk about this being dispersion from the mean. This is your mean, your 20 day moving average, which is your default setting. But you can use different numbers there. And these are your standard deviations. These are your two standard deviation. Uh, and that's what we can see here is these price moves here are getting wider and wider from the mean. And so what does that mean is that your Bollinger Bands or the standard deviations are getting wider and wider and wider. And what we can see is that the, the implied volatility or the, the historic volatility is getting is, is increasing as these Bollinger Bands widen. And again, you're, the great thing is, is it tells you that the, this is not just on a down move. You're seeing volatility pick up on an up move uh, with those Bollinger Bands widening. You can see here that throughout this period that we saw back in October, we saw the ASX, so the Aussie dollar having a fairly tight range. The, the, apart from this day here, the, the moves were fairly confined. There, you know, there wasn't really um, a great ferocity to really push this higher and, and you know, markets were fairly contained into 7040. Uh, but volatility was subsiding. We saw Bollinger Bands contract as well. And it tells you what's happened. It gives you a, a sort of a factual picture situation of what volatility is doing. And that's really where we are. And if we, if we have a look at how this feeds into um, actual statistics. You don't need to be a statistician to to understand this, but in a normal distribution, you will see that within um, you know the the, the, vari the variabilities um, and stat statistics uh, will be confined within six to one standard deviation. Um, well, sixty eight percent of these variabilities will be contained within one standard deviation, and uh, you know more noise is going to be captured within two standard deviations, uh, and that contains ninety five point four percent of the variabilities. Um, uh, and those factors there as well. And if we go to stat three standard deviations, well, that, that, that contains 99.7% uh, of the variabilities playing through in the statistics and the data there. So we use a two standard deviation because it does capture most of that situation. And um, when we go to this again, that's why we tend to use a two standard deviation move there because it does Price tends not to move there. Remember, it captures 95% of, of the move. Uh, and some people will use a two and a half standard deviation. But what you can see there is that price, when it's moving away from the mean, um, tends to be uh, about two standard deviations. And then you might get a mean reverting move there as well. So that's really the, the crux of what a Bollinger Band is. I think Bollinger Bands work really, really well um, in a sideways trending market. I will apply an RSI, for example, and you can see this period here throughout July, uh, throughout the month of July, where, you know, you can see the 20 day moving average moving perfectly sideways. And that to me is, a, you know, it's, it's a fairly, fairly clear confidence that you've got a, a sideways trending market. And there's a brilliant way to trade a sideways trending market. And that's when you use a, apply a Bollinger Band and an RSI and using a confluence of various indicators to show that volatility is fairly low. Um, and there's disagreement in markets. And you can just basically look to fade the market within a two standard deviation range. And with that RSI being around mid range at 50, uh, if the RSI is at 50, then you'll be looking to fade moves into the top Bollinger Band and you'll be looking to, to buy on any kind of pullbacks there for a mean reverting move. And I think that works really, really well. Yeah, Bollinger Bands and RSIs are fantastic tools for using in sideways trending markets. And when you tend to see volatility increase and you tend to see those Bollinger Bands widen um, and the market's making higher highs, and making higher lows, you tend to see price hugging the upper Bollinger Band and having people looking to buy into the 20 day moving average for a mean reverting move. So we can use this effectively. But so we use volatility to speculate and get on our outcomes. We can also use volatility um, to understand you know, how much risk we need to take on, how much further away from the market we need to be without you know, increasing the chance of just get suddenly getting stopped out. OK, so what is implied volatility? Well, we've looked at what's happened, statistics and data points that have happened in the past and how that increases uh, realized volatility or decreases realized volatility. But let's have a look at implied volatility. And for that, we're going to look at options pricing. Now, we don't need to be hardcore options junkies and traders to understand implied volatility, although, you know, it does give you a helping hand. And we're not looking at actually trading volatility, although I'll quickly go through a couple of strategies that, that I like to use myself when I'm trading volatility. But what is implied volatility? Well, it's the same as realized volatility, except we're using options pricing um, to give us that, that edge there. It reflects expectations of where volatility in the instrument might be headed over a specific period in time. Again, it doesn't predict where a market's going to go, 
just the extent of a potential move, an implied move in the market is therefore forward looking. Um, it is for me, um, when I'm trying to assess what's happening, far more relevant for this than realized volatility, uh, which just looks at those past statistical data. OK, so what we're looking at is, is the market and specifically the big players having a look at the implied volatility in a, in a certain asset over a specific period and saying this is the expected move that we see in price. And again, that's agnostic, it could be up and could be down. But this is the expected move that we're going to see. And what happens is the market will imply time. Well, how, long, how long is it until the, the expiry of that, that situation? So time premium is, is obviously a factor, but they'll look at economic data points, central bank speakers, um, what is the key um, political events that could come through in that period? And they'll make an assessment that all of these factors mean there could be changes to monetary policy, government policy, but the price of money and the price of move in that market is X. And that's why I like it, because everyone's all the institutional guys have had a good chance to understand everything that's on the calendar, be it political, you know, all the factors that I talked about. And they say, well, this, this is what it means for us. And you'll see a lot of time that a lot of retail traders will say, oh, non-farm payroll is coming out. Yeah, I'm going to buy the US dollar because we think this is going to happen. When you actually look at implied volatility and the market saying we're actually going to see a 20 point move in Aussie dollar, it's really not going to be that big a deal. Um, but they think there's going to be this big move. So I'll actually probably look at the implied volatility and say, well, look, you know, the professional trading market out there is saying that this isn't this isn't actually going to cause that much of a move. Therefore, I'm quite happy to hold positions over that announcement because the market doesn't really see it being that big an issue. Whereas if you, you, know, you you've got an announcement coming up and you've seen that the market's got a high volatility, yeah, you might want to reduce your exposure going into that because you know, the market's saying that there could be a big move. You know, if it's outside of my control, I have no insight what's going to happen with that, that data point or that outcome. You know, why wouldn't I not just reduce my exposures to that? Because, again, we're trying to manage the risk. Implied volatility does that job for us, and that's why we really like it. Implied volatility, therefore, is the based on the price changes in options. An option price increases because of higher implied volatility, larger expected move. Option prices decrease because of lower expected implied volatility, therefore lower expected price. So effectively, it gives us the option price. And that's what we're interested in, the premium to buy those options. Implied volatility is a key component in what we call the Black Shoals model, which is a financial product uh, developed many, many years ago and really brought to its own in options trading, I think in about 1997. But the Black Shoals formula gives us um, these various um, variables which we plug in and it gives us the premium for the option. And that's what we're interested in. So the inputs that we'll look at in Black Shoals in FX trading is implied volatility, the actual time to expiration of that option, um, when the option gets paid out, um, uh, the spot price at the time, um, the strike price by which you're in the money or out the money, and the risk-free rate. So what's the risk-free rate? Well, we use the U.S. Treasury market because you're not, they're not going to default on their money. So it could be U.S. money market rates. It could be German bunds. Um, but I'll probably use the, the U.S. 10-year Treasury or the risk-free rate in this situation. So they're the variables that go into this. You plug those into the Black Shoals formula and effectively you will be given um, a, a, a premium uh, or uh, that's really what we're after. So the cost to buy a put and the cost to buy a call or, or sell a call, for example. We're going to go over that page. But if I can plug these various factors into... Um, I use Bloomberg here, but I'll show you another way that you, if you haven't got a Bloomberg terminal, which I'm sure most of you won't, um, how we can actually get this situation. So in the bottom right hand corner, um, I'm going to be looking to, first of all, assess the level of implied volatility, understand the implied and expected move that comes out as a result of us putting that into the Black Shoals formula. And then by getting that expected move, understand that the, the risk tolerance in a position and the potential position size that we can have. Um, from that point, we can actually achieve better probability outcomes and entry points as well. So first of all, I want to understand um, the implied volatility. So this is something that I did the other day, and we, we saw the Australian dollar um, trading at 72.97 at the time. I wanted to understand what the, the one-week move was going to be using one-week implied volatility. So this is the implied volatility in the Australian dollar for one week, you know, seven days. And I've put it into the black shells there, and you can see that the cost with all the various factors such as time premium, the strike, uh, the underlying price, 
and all these factors, then the model will come out and say that the cost to buy um, a call is 37 points and the cost to buy a put is 38 points. I'm not going to go into the, the options in any kind of depth, but what I want to do is understand then if you add up those two premiums together, we get an implied move over the seven days of 75 points. That's using a volatility of just under 9%. So the market has said to me that we've assessed everything over the next seven days. That's everything that's happened in Australia. That's everything that's happened in China. Everything that could influence price in this two currency pairs. And we will. We think that there's going to be a 75 point range or 75 point move either side of spot. So it could be up, it could be down. But the most important point here is that there is a move that's implied from that volatility structure of 75 points. So I'm going into the trade and I'm saying to myself, well, 72.97, you know, I think over the week, the market's saying that it probably won't get much more than downside than 72.22 um, and probably won't get much more than 73.72. So if I'm going into the trade and I think I'm going to be long at 72.97 and I've got a, a, a target of around 74.50, well, you know, the market's given me a guide that it's probably going to take more than seven days to get there. So for people who like to trade this after two days, well, I can look at the implied vol and I can actually have a look at the expected move and say, well, you know, I'm not going to be in the market for more than a week. I'm going to be in the market for more than a week. And I think that's the most important thing is, is that you're, you're, you know, if you've got this target up at a certain level, you know, how long is it going to take to get there? The implied volatility in the market will give you a, a rough guide of how this works. Of course, you can say that the market's wrong. And if we have a look at the straddle strategy, which is a, a, a fairly vanilla um, option strategy, you can buy and sell volatility. So I will look at the straddle price or the cost of the implied move, which we can see here is 75 points. And I will say that the current spot price is 72.97. If I add 75 points, and take off 75 points, which you can see here are our two um, break even points. If the market has a move within that um, and settles outside of that, um, those two ranges by the end of by, by that expiry, I will make that per point that I get. And that's where I say to myself, the market's mispricing uh, volatility and I can buy volatility. Um, and I, my, I know my, my maximum loss, but effectively, if it trades outside of those two break even points, you know, every, every Every point that it makes, I make that times my stake. Um, and that's really how you can make money buying volatility. And I think that's a really good way to trade. But that's not what we're trying to do here. You know, there are option strategies where we can buy and sell vol. But effectively, what we're looking at is, is the cost and the move there, 75 points. What I'll probably then do is I'll, is I'll actually chart this myself. So I'm having a look at one week volatility and I'm having looking at the one month implied volatility. So what is the implied volatility over a month in the Australian dollar? And you can see the red line is one month. Uh, and the more volatile one week uh, is is the white mark there, and you can see at nine percent, it's 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 not really that elevated relative to where we've been in in past two periods. So, you know, seventy five points. I'm saying, well, that's that's pretty good. That's not too bad, but uh, you know, it's pretty low, um, and 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 that's you know kind of where we've been. Now, how do we put this into the real world? Because if you, for the you that don't have Bloomberg terminals, how can you find this information yourself? Well, I go to investing.com. I think you know, you've got some, some good information there. So what we can do is we can go to the link. I'll send you the link as part of the webinar. The first thing you want to do is, is choose how far uh, you want the implied volatility to be. So you can choose overnight. And that's really good if you're going into things like the non-farm payrolls and you want to understand um, options, uh, potential moves on a certain currency pair, which you can see here on the left hand side, um, all the different currency pairs you can choose from. I've chosen the Australian dollar there, but I could easily choose euro dollar. Um, but let's go back to the Australian dollar. There. So what I'm going to do is the first thing I want to do is, is, is choose um, how where, the, the expected move over a specific period. So one day, one week, two weeks, one month. Most of the time I'm going to be using one week and one month. But let's do one week, for example, because that's the sort of duration that I, when I tend to trade, it will be for one day up to you know, two weeks. So I'll try and you know, look at one week here. The, the next thing I need to do is have a look at the strike price. And what we want to do is get this strike price as close um, to the market as we possibly can. Now, the market at, at this point in time is trading at 72.40. It's come down a little bit from the example I just used there. Uh, and what we do is we've got the strike price. This is at the money. So this, this, this strike price is the same or as close to um, where the market's trading at that time. And you can see this is done in increments of 10 points. But let's say the market's trading 72.40 right now. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the cost. You can see the volatility there. It's trading at 9% or 8.99%, which we've just looked at as well. Now, how to pl plugging in that volatility into the Black-Scholes formula, and we get 
the price to buy a call at 33 pips and the price to buy a put at 39 pips. So if you add up the two, effectively, you've got 72 points. Um, so yeah, the, the expected move is now 72 points. So again, um, we've used the average true range, which we can see is 66 points. But when we're actually looking forward and we're using implied volatility, we can see that over the coming week, the expected move in the Australian dollar is expected to be 72 points. So again, I will now use that and say to myself, OK, well, I need my stop loss to be probably over 72 points away, perhaps even more, you know, one and a half times that that implied move just to give myself a bit more breathing room. Then we go back into the the idea of, you know, if I'm taking that much risk on, you know, how much reward do I need to do? I mean, I probably want to go in and have a look at, you know, two times risk reward. And um, if I go into uh, this chart here, which uh, I went through in my last situation, you know, when your risk when your risk uh, win ratio is is fifty percent, and you know, you use this chart here just to understand about what sort of um, risk rewards I need to go in, depending on your uh, on on your win rate, and and I'll look at my win rate after a sample of trades, and I've analysed that. But for example, if my win rate's around forty five percent, which is kind of really where I'm going. Um, you know, I need to make sure that I'm if I'm risking one dollar, uh, I'm trying to get two dollars back in the market there as well, or perhaps a little bit more. Um, but certainly that's what we're looking at in terms of how that plays into that situation. So what we've got is is, is we're looking at how uh, implied volatility is and what the sort of moves that we can get. And we can apply that to our risk formula as well. Uh, one of the things we look at um, is is uh, these implied vols and I'll come in in the morning and I'll have a look at uh, you know how these implied vols compare to other currencies so at this point in time you can see that the pound has a one month implied volatility of 14.8 percent which gives us a fairly punchy move but that's no surprise because the pound is moving all over the place and we've got these big political events which could go either way and therefore I know where I can get a great oversight that if I want a big move and I want to be attracted to something that could have a really big move when I come in I'll have a look at this implied volatility and the British pound is, is by far expected to have the biggest move over the next month. The Swedish krona is expected to have a big move, high beta currencies. And then you can see that the, the lesser moves are coming through of implied volatility in the yen and the Swiss franc and the CAD of around seven. And what can actually do is, is see changes on the day in those kind of implied volatilities as well. But immediately I say to myself, well, if I like moves, if I like range, then I want to be involved in the British pound. 14.8% is pretty punchy. Um, and actually, um, you know, if you if you look at that on a holistic basis, you, you, you can put that into your into your options pricing, uh, into your model, and you'd probably see that trading uh, around about 600 points or so. The other thing that we look at is these things called risk reversals. Now, risk reversals measure the volatility skew between well, what it costs for one month puts between the pound and the US dollar, for example, or one currency relative to another. So it's the cost of volatility of puts versus calls. So if you see a situation where the volatility um, uh, of a put um, with a 25 delta for the British pound is 15% uh, and the volatility of a call the same um, for the same expiry um, uh, is 13, then you're going to see negative two. And that's kind of what we're seeing there as well. So the higher the volatility, the higher the demand for that currency, the bigger the, the expected move coming through. And that's what we look at is the skew there. So what we're seeing here is that the, the, the skew for British pounds versus the US dollar is that we're seeing a deeply um, negative bias for optionality. So people are paying up and expecting higher moves in puts relative to calls. And that, that, that skew is at 2.4 times. So what we're doing here is we're getting a sense um, or various time frames of the skew of put optionality relative to call optionality and the various volatilities that are involved in that. So again, I can come in here and, you know, we look at the, the commitment of trader report where everyone looks at, you know, OK, you know, this is, comes out every Saturday and we can see that leveraged traders are net short the Australian dollar and asset managers, institutional traders are net short the Australian dollar. And now we have this big, big net short position on the Australian dollar. And that's great. That looks at Aussie futures. But let's have a look at the skew in the options market, which is much more liquid, much more moving around much more fluid and we can see here that the options positions are very very bearish on the pound they're paying up for those volatilities uh, in in puts relative to calls and then you've got this kind of neutral position um, on, on a few of these currencies that gets progressively more bearish into some of the petro currencies there 
And again, that's something that we call risk reversals. It gives us an understanding about sentiment there. And you can see that sentiment in the British pound is deeply pessimistic and they're expecting, and people are paying up and expecting big moves in those, in those moves. We can also measure those uh, implied volatilities um, and those risk reversals that I just talked about relative to the underlying spot price. And what I've done here is I've looked at the 25 delta um, or the one month uh, risk reversals for pound. And you can see that here coming down at 2.47 negative. So big, big bias to be, be to be negative on, on, on pay up or you know, the premium for put options is much higher than that of call options. Um, showing much greater demand for puts over calls, which gives you the right to sell those options. And you can see here that there's a misalignment in price between that and the British pound. So what does that tell me? Does that tell me that the British pound is going to play catch up to these options where you can generally see a strong correlation between the two in terms of direction? Or does it tell me that the, the pound has upside because options traders are so, so bearish on where this is going and they've obviously protected their downside. Well, I think it's, it's one or the other, but I think for me at the moment, it does feel that the market has protected themselves to the downside. And this is showing a lot about sentiment being too bearish on the pound. If we do see some good news, some reconciliation in the, in, in the political situation, these option traders are going to cover some of these positions and that's going to move the pound up. So this tells me a lot about extreme sentiment that's coming through at any one time. I like to, to put various models on these risk reversals to give us a sense of, um, you know, how pessimistic people are. You can have a look at the euro dollar now, which is the white line relative to, to euro dollar risk reversals, which shows here, um, okay, so we're negative 0.58. So there is a skew in favor of put optionality on put volatility um, higher than call volatility. So there's been a demand for euro dollar puts as opposed to calls, but it has been contracting. You can see people have been covering those those puts and, and the volatility in the calls have been increasing and therefore people are becoming slightly more bullish on the pair in the options market. Now that's obviously been reverberated and, and reiterated in the underlying spot market, but you can see these two tend to track each other pretty well. And does that necessarily mean now that the euro dollar spot price is the one that we all trade has some upside? Well, perhaps it does. We'll have to see, but it tells you that the options market has been pairing back some of that bearish exposure and perhaps that the euro dollar could be um, you know, uh, due for a bit of a bounce in that situation as well. So what we'll look at is a situation where, um, you know, we can actually look at implied volatilities and, and implied moves. And if I go back to this, I think it's really interesting to say that, you know, 75 points is the implied move over a coming week. So if I go back to the chart and I have a look at um, Aussie dollar here, you know, I can see that the, the upper Bollinger Band is trading around 73.55. Um, and I can see um, the current spot price is around uh, uh, 7350, 73, uh, 7230. Yeah, I've got about up 80 points of upside until I get into the sort of top end of those brackets there, or maybe a bit more. And again, you know, that where does that lead me to to understand where my risk is? So if I've got um, you know 80 points or 90 points of upside to get into the the, the upper echelons of those of those um, those brackets there and the implied move over the week is is 75 points well you know I, I'd probably be saying to myself well you know you, you could get a bit of a move up into those top Bollinger bands probably a little bit higher there's a little bit of a gap there but if you if you say that the employed move 75 points, you know, and we've got a, a decent move up to that situation. Well, you know, you've got a little bit more room to run. But if that Bollinger Band was, you know, 75 points away, then you'd have a very high probability um, that the the move would be faded into that point. So I'd be looking to leave sell orders into the top Bollinger Band on the idea that the market's saying that there could be a 75 point move. And if it coincides with the top Bollinger Band, then that's again, you know, that contains most of the information that we see, 95% of the information with a statistical move that's coming through as well. So again, that gives me a high probability move to fade that situation there as well. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to combine the statistical historic data with potential moves as well. And I'm trying to understand how far in relation to this top Bollinger Band I'm going to be with the expected move that's implied through the market as well. And that will give me uh, a situation there as well. We can have a look at historical data through the average true range momentum indicators through Bollinger Bands. And that works out really well. But what we can actually do is we can use um, implied volatility through various websites um, you know, speaking to your relationship manager here at Pepperstone to ex to look at the expected move over various time frames over various events and see what the market's doing for you. And that will tell you um, everything you need to know. So this is what I tend to use 
rather than those backward looking indicators, we can actually add the premiums together and get the expected move over any time frame uh, given by the market. I think that's a really unique way of trading and looking at how we can manage risks in that situation. If we combine that with um, you know, historical volatilities using Bollinger Bands and fade moves into those higher probability areas, I think that's a really good way of looking at it as well. Um, uh, if, you, if you want any more information, please follow me at chriswestern underscore PS. Um, or reach out uh, and um, you know, certainly we'll be in, uh, be in touch and, and, and look forward to, to, uh, to doing more webinars in the future. Thank you.